Hey there. Hello, Matthew. How are you? Good. Another big day. It's, it's been, uh, been yeah, good. it's another big week, really, hasn't it? Yeah, definitely. I'm yes. just doing a little bit of um, editing here while we go, so that's okay. I'm just going to do some <laughs> housekeeping as usual and Shoot. then get out of the way. I'm going to assume that we are live. I'm uh, looking for it in the stream, so if you are here, please do pop in and say hi so that we know that we're not talking to ourselves or each other. Um, that's a great conversation, but Matthew's here tonight to talk to you, not to me. So, <laughs> so do whatever. Say hi, do whatever. Do say <laughs> hi and let us know where you are from because we do have people from right around the world, um, particularly in New Zealand. So Kiwi's mm. up to you. Most definitely. And, uh, do have, I can see we do have a, pe a few people popping in now. So we are live, just not quite sure where. <laughs> <laughs> There's been lots of changes lately and we're just rolling to keep up. So uh -huh. we have you here. Oh, Some there we go. Oh, Effie's here. Now, Effie is coming to us from the Meditation with Matthew community, so the group on cool. Facebook. Hey, Effie. And uh, she hasn't given permission for Facebook, uh, for Be Live to draw in her name and her profile picture. But So thank you, honey, for saying it's to Effie. And uh, and there's Kylie as well. Hi, Kylie. I'm, just jumping, I'm jumping ahead of you, but it's good to know that you're here. And what we'd love for you to do is to hit the little button with the arrow on it that goes like that. So if you're over in the Meditation with Matthew community, you can't actually do that. So jump over to his page, which is Matthew Greenwood Spiritual Journey. So come and talk to us live on the page. If you do comment from the group, we will still see you, or Matthew will still see your comments, but uh, not necessarily know exactly who you are, and uh, and it makes it a little bit harder to um, to actually tap the button and have a party over here. So we'd like to get as many people involved as humanly possible, and we need your help to do that. The other thing is, as I mentioned before, we are on, we're live streaming to two different places, uh, which is the Meditation with Matthew Group and the Medi um, Matthew Green Spiritual Journeys page. If you are looking at this at any, on any other page, it's got to be a replay. So <laughs> that's all I'm going to say about that. So we're live on those two places. Please um, come over to the uh, Matthew Green Spiritual Journey page. And that's where the real party is. The other thing is if you make a comment and you're on the page, you will get a message from an automated message from Matthew's, uh, the chat bot that's connected. And the chat bot will say you offer you an opportunity to enter for a spirit guide reading. If you've already given us your details and all things being equal, you will just get a message saying welcome back. So you won't be asked to give your uh, your email to go into the draw for a spirit guide reading. But uh, of course, if you want, you're welcome to give it to us again. <laughs> There's no requirement to do that. So hopefully you'll just get a hi and welcome back message. And uh, and if you want to go into the draw for a spirit guide, if you're, it's your first time here and your first time interacting with the chatbot, the automated messaging, do follow the bouncy ball and you'll be registered to go in the draw for a spirit guide reading, which leads me to Matthew. <laughs> and I'm out. <laughs> Thanks, Adair. See ya. Hey, guys. Uh, a few hellos. So I, I did say a couple before. Uh, we've got Janine Thomas. Hey, Janine. Um, we have, have – we've got Gail Humphreys. We've got Clay. We've got – Dale Harper and um, oh, it's Janine again. <laughs> Thanks, Janine. Janine had a had a spirit guide reading this afternoon. Um, thanks for the feedback. Hey guys, well we've got a, a winner from last week, um, which is Jackie Walton. So if Jackie's listening in, or uh, her name will come up, but we'll get in contact with uh, Jackie very soon and she's got a half hour spirit guide reading heading her way and uh, but she has to contact us back for that to happen um, so we'll be leaving a message for her and uh, she just needs to 
either call me or text message me. So that's that. Um, Tonight we've got a continuation of last week, talking about the Native American culture. I really only scratched the surface last week, and um, there's just a whole lot more to be said. And uh, I'll try to get as much in as I can tonight. And uh, um, and we've got our usual to start the evening. We've got our usual grounding exercise. So again, this is a um, an exercise to help keep you not only grounded, but to keep your head clear, to help to keep you stronger and uh, just feeling more at peace with yourself. So um, let's go into this now. And a great thing with this grounding exercise is to not just be doing it on a Thursday night because that's not gonna do a whole lot. So it's important to be doing this a couple of times a day at least, particularly if you're a practitioner or you're seeing a lot of people, it would be important to, to do it probably a little bit more often than a couple of times a day. Because what this does, it keeps your energy also clear of other people's energy, particularly if you're working on a deeper level with people emotionally and spiritually. Um, and it just keeps you in, in the now and it keeps your energy much open for the next person that you're helping out. So here we go. Just to start with, if you can close your eyes. And as you breathe, make each breath a conscious breath. And with that breath, do your best to breathe in for about four seconds and so making it a nice deep one and with the breath out about the same. You may vary that, but uh, at least four seconds. In and out. And so know something really um, in particular with this is what you're doing is actually with that conscious breath, you're breathing in life force, which we cannot do without. We need to be taking in life force every day and so if we're not taking it in in a healthy way like this we need to be taking it from other people which hey i'm sure you don't want to be doing that so the trick is to have a daily ritual of this which keeps you strong clear and on track okay so with this next deep breath in Take a nice deep full one of life force and then with the breath out, I'd like you to push that life force down through your body, your base chakra, your legs, your feet and down into the earth. And just keep that same cycle of breathing going for a few more breaths until you feel uh, some sort of flow of energy or tingling in your feet which is a recognition of energy flow down through into the earth. Very cool. So next we're actually going to go deeper. So our energy system is incredibly expansive, far more than they say in the books. Our energy system is limitless. So we have a plethora of chakras down below the feet and the deepest one we have is right down at the core of the earth. This is your connection at its deepest level with the earth, but also it connects you with all other spiritual cultures that are heart connected on the planet. And it unifies your consciousness with theirs at a deep level. So now taking another deep full breath in. This time with the breath out push it right down to the core of the earth and just keep that cycle of breathing going too knowing that what you're also doing is not only engaging with your earth chakra that deeper chakra point in your energy system you're actually also connecting with the earth's core chakra because they're in exactly the same place so you open up to your earth chakra, you naturally flow into the earth's core energy, which is what we're actually supposed to be doing. Our energy system should fully integrate with the earth's 
energy system. That's why we're here on this planet, not another one. And so a, a great recognition of connecting with that chakra is an all over feeling of groundedness, uh, of peace, or even a, a feeling of vibration around you, tingling maybe. All right, so that's your earth chakra. So now, once you've got that, what I'd like you to do is just relax your breath a little. Not so focused because you're already taking in life force. You're already connected to your base chakra, your earth chakra. Now what I'd like you to do is bring your focus to the center of your body, center of your physical body to start with. We're actually going to be tapping into the deepest part of your energy system, which is your core star energy or the God force within this highest vibrational energy that can be found. So as you dive into the center of your physical, knowing that we are far more than just physical, I want you to keep diving deeper into that expansiveness within. And keep diving in until you feel or see a high vibrational energy source or a light. What you're sensing when you pick up on that is literally the God force within you. Or your core star energy. It's the same thing. Okay, so now that you've connected with that light, now we're going to step it out. So to start with, expanding that light out from within until it completely fills your physical body. As it fills your physical body, imagine every cell in your body being activated by that light. Great. So as you feel your physical, now bring your awareness to what I classify as your human, the human aspect of your energy system, which is seven energy bodies out, which is roughly equates to about three to four meters out for the majority of people. So if you can expand that light out to fill an area three meters, three to four meters all around you. And now knowing that you're far, far more than human, there's much more to you than that. A greater part of our, us is galactic and that's our source. That's where we, our DNA stems from. But that's for another Thursday night. Okay, so now, as you fill that space, three meters out in all directions, I'm going to count to three. And what I would like you to do is just let that light explode out in all directions limitlessly. So one, two, with a big breath out, three. Just let it go. No boundaries, no limitations. That's a human thing. Let your mind extend beyond three dimensional reality. And just keep pushing that light out. And just to throw something else into the, the ring. At the moment, you're expanding that light out through space. Now let's expand it out through time. 
So now, as you shift into that thought of expanding it out through into your future, set a little uh, precedent or set a little intention with that light as you expand it out through time and imagine it expanding out into your optimum spiritual path. knowing that as you expand that energy, that light out into your optimum spiritual path, what will happen is as you go through, step through into your future, day at a time, whenever you get to a junction point and you have maybe a choice of paths, then the most highest vibrational one will be the strongest. And it will be the one with the spotlight on it. Everything else will feel very low vibrational. It won't feel like it has any strength to it. Beautiful. Okay. So just bringing your awareness now back to your physical body, you do not and you should not have to bring that light in. So keep that light expanded out. Just know that it will be. And as you bring your awareness back to your physical, what we want to do is just reground your energy through the base chakra will be enough. So just bringing your focus back to your breath, pulling in that life force, breathing that life force in, and then with the breath out, push it down through your body, your base chakra, your legs, your feet, and down into the earth. All right. So there you go, guys. That is, if you can do that exercise a couple of times a day at least, believe me, you'll reap the benefits of it. And you, you should feel, some feel, feel the benefits of that almost straight away. Others, it just takes a little bit longer, a bit more commitment, particularly sometimes the head kind of takes over in your life and um, it takes a bit to sort of shake that off and link more into the heart chakra but uh, one thing that happens when you do you do that grounding exercise you do link into the heart chakra more um, because generally the opposite happens so when your base chakra is damaged through trauma through your life then you tend to disconnect at the heart as soon as you start actively doing work on the base chakra the heart actively starts to open up all by itself all right, so I've got just a couple more hellos before uh, we get on with things. Uh, Daniel's here. Hey, Daniel. Uh, oh, Colin Morris. I know Colin Morris. And Patricia Brown. Um, we've got uh, 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 Jessica Bourne and Janine Thomas again. There we go. Okay, so the Native American culture. Um, I did um, go over a little bit of it last week. Um, so just, um, sort of coming back into this space of, uh, what I talked about last week, I spent back in 2001, I spent, um, uh, five months on Rosebud Indian Reservation in South Dakota. And, uh, I think I did tell the story of how I got there. So it was through, um, meeting someone that, uh, actually had, um, uh, grandfather that lived on, on Pine Ridge was the reservation that was to the west of, of uh, Rosebud. And so many things opened up when I was over there. It was great to be a part of the culture. Um, it was just a, oh, it was an amazing experience. And um, 
I mean, I highly suggest to people, you know, not necessarily just the Native American culture, but any Native culture, spend time with, with, with the people, with the different tribes, because they all have their own ways of doing things, but particularly the Native cultures have incredible ways of looking at life. And uh, this is one of the biggest things that hit me when I, I lived on Rosebud. So um, what I'd like to do to start with is just share a little story. It's a prophecy, actually. Um, this prophecy uh, was brought forward um, many, many hundreds of, hundreds of years ago. This prophecy was uh, taken in by the, by the visionaries of the tribes, um, medicine men, medicine women, the shamans, and uh, it was this... Um, was handed down from generation to generation. And, and this is how the prophecy goes. And I should um, just explain something. So at that time, I was given this prophecy by one of my guides who is a Native American medicine man. Then I was given almost the, the same thing word for word by one of the elders I met on Rosebud. But then I got the finish of the story in a book uh, written by a Lakota medicine man. So I'll just give you, I'll, I'll start from, from one to three and we'll, uh, you'll get the whole uh, vision of it. So back in the, in the early days, roughly about two to 300 years ago, uh, these visions were coming in to um, the visionaries and uh, what was being seen was a time that was coming when uh, these strange people would come from another land um, uh, white people and uh, the damage that they were going to do um, the the uh, visionaries couldn't understand the way they were acting in the in the visions um, couldn't understand the way they were uh, dealing with the native people um, and what they were doing to the earth and to the buffalo as well and so uh, there was a lot of fear that was generated by this. But the other part of the vision was that the, the medicine people and the warriors and the elders who were appeared like they were going to be dying in many conflicts that were going to be happening, um, they were going to be coming back. And, um, and so what they called they started the medicine people actually began to put a dance together a special ritual ceremony and it was called the ghost dance and this ghost dance started to come up in the late 1800s uh, when a lot of the the traumatic stuff was really happening where the government forces were bringing the, the people in onto reservations and, and a lot of them were being killed, obviously. We, we know many of the stories. Wounded Knee is probably just scratching the surface of um, uh, the many stories. Um, Trail of Tears is another one with the Cherokee. Um, and so um, all of these um, deaths that occurred... Um, what what was going on then in that time in the late 1800s was that they thought the the people who had heard these these visions um, that were handed down from generation to generation they assumed that the the dead warriors and the the elders and medicine people were going to come back then when they thought it was needed but it wasn't to be that way and this is what um, Wallace Black Elk talked about in in one of his books that he wrote and in the book um, it says that it was never to, to be in that time it was to take seven generations from the time the visions were first seen and that's when the the warriors and the medicine people would come back so yes you probably guessed guessed it that time is now so how those warriors and medicine people are coming back is they're coming back as guides for us, but they're also coming back in us. So there are many people that are embracing with um, 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 greatly the, the Native American culture and the Aboriginal culture, the Maori culture, 
And there are similar stories throughout many of the, the native cultures of uh, uh, this time that we were step, we're stepping into now. Now, why it took seven generations is the big, the big one. Native American, the Native American elders and, and people needed in spirit, needed to understand what white people were all about. That's one half of it. But the other half is the fact that white people needed to get to a certain point where they had almost nothing left. And uh, when desperation was there, it's only then it was seen and it was visioned that uh, people would start working together. And that's why the medicine people and the warriors are coming back is to to work for the people and work for the earth to bring harmony and balance back. And so this was one of the things that um, stood out the most with the people I stayed with and, um, you know, I, I was around over there who were deeply spiritual and who lived their lives in an authentic way. Yes, they lived in houses, but they still held on to their ceremonies and rituals as being a part of their life. Nothing had changed on that level. Um, and so these are the things that actually kept kept those people strong and uh, it kept keeps the, the tribe strong too, even with the difficulties the tribes have at times, particularly reservations. It's, um, I think I talked about this last week. It's very similar to, to the Native American, sorry, to the Aboriginal culture and the African culture and the South American cultures, um, you know, that have been impacted by white settlement. Um, the, the divide and conquer um, process has always been there. And uh, look, there's probably a lot of English people out there or, or from English origins. Look, I've got English origins myself. But one thing I found by accident and um, I haven't been able to find it again, so it's probably been taken down. But many, many years ago, I found a, a charter or an agenda that one of the great kings and queens of that time, you know, two, three hundred years ago, um, had had set up for the um, the captains of ships going to the new worlds and discovering new cultures. This divide and conquer was really part of that agenda, part of that uh, charter. Um, there it was never to be integration. It was to be conquer um, through dividing the people, which is what has been done in uh, pretty much every native culture on the planet. Um, and this, this division is to um, take the children away from the families, um, to dress them in... In white people's clothing, cut the hair. To uh, they had to dismiss their language, their spirituality, and uh, and believe only in Christianity. And they were taught to believe that their own their own spiritual culture was evil, and uh, that um, the old medicine ways were evil. And I, I'm not too sure if I said this last week or not, but it was only in the 1970s that those laws were repealed um, in the States because the elders just had had enough. So it was only in 1970 that those laws were changed, that uh, they couldn't do their medicine ways, that ceremonies were illegal, that they would be jailed for it. And um, so this is how deep, deeply scared the government and uh, uh, the powers that be are of the native cultures because what is it they hold? They hold groundedness. They hold strength of individuality and they hold a unique love and connection with the planet, which is what brings balance. Now, to keep the people in fear, um, you take the balance away from them. You take the ceremonies and rituals away from them and that's what was done. Um, there's a, um, uh, in the drum making workshops that I do, which, uh, um, so when I do a drum making workshop, uh, I make the frames up. Fortunately, I've, I'm an ex-furniture maker. So um, the frames are a 13-sided frame. And why I do that is because um, 
the 13 moon calendar was the original reason or the original calendar and um, that people worked by which was working around the um, the moon cycles knowing that each moon cycle has a particular energy about it now what happened back in the 1300s the um, the Roman Catholic Church uh, dismissed the pagan and uh, the native way of looking at the calendar and um, brought it into a 12-month calendar. The reason for that was, again, to divide, to divide you from the natural cycles of nature. And this is what they did. So when you take people, you disconnect people from nature and from the earth, you actually uh, put them in fear and anxiety because they're no longer grounded anymore and they're easily controllable. So why I'm saying all this is the tribes have been um, affected um, by this, but they're still there. And this is the, the one powerful thing about uh, all of the tribal cultures on the planet is they still they they've taken their power back and they are taking their power back and um, they still hold those ceremonies strong uh, within them and look i thought i'd talk a little bit about um, some of the ceremonies and rituals that they do um, one of the most common is the sweat lodge um, or inipi ceremony i-n-i-p-i so this is a ceremony that uh, can be done just on its own or quite often it's it's done in conjunction with other big ceremonies. And uh, so it's a cleansing, a purification ceremony. It's normally done over four rounds, which means... Um, so basically, for those that don't know what a, a, a sweat lodge ceremony is, it's kind of like a sauna, but it's far more intense. So uh, an igloo-shaped... Uh, arrangement is made um, in the old days it would have been covered with buffalo hides um, it's made, made with pine saplings and it is in a, a dome shape a low dome shape there is a pit in the middle that hot rocks are put into but the rocks are actually heated up outside uh, when in each round uh, and each round could go for approximately um, maybe 15 to 20 minutes um, and in each round, this is in the, a traditional uh, sweat lodge ceremony, uh, seven rocks are brought into each round. So at the end of that, those four rounds, you have 28 rocks. So it gets pretty hot. Um, but the, the way I was taught was that uh, the first round is about the physical body. So the physical body is the first thing that gets impacted by a change in environment. And... Uh, and so you have to adjust to that heat. So there's there's the thing that comes in next for the second round is the mind because the mind is really it can control our ability to stay at peace or to go into fear, fight or flight. And um, and of course there needs to be um, some sort of prayer or connection to the reason for being in that sweat lodge for each round. And so this is this is done. Uh, there are quite often songs or just prayers. Um, and with this, what happens is um, uh, you're you basically given an opp opportunity to see and to work with your mind in that in that time in the second round. Same with the physical in the first. Now the third round, which is quite often the the hottest and sometimes the most difficult third round is the emotions now you know we know all about emotions um, quite often emotions are suppressed because um, of trauma that's happened through our life particularly at childhood um, and um, uh, what what comes of that is you can have emotions coming up in the in the middle of um, that sweat lodge so I've I've heard people cry I've heard people scream. Um, it's quite often where people get very uncomfortable and they want to get out of the sweat lodge. And, um, and then, um, but again, prayers are said and there are ways to minimise the effect of the heat. Um, and so 
there's always support within the sweat lodge. And then, of course, the fourth round is when you find peace. And generally, if you've been able to get through those first three rounds, well, the third round is for vision. And uh, this is where you really, really begin to connect with the ancestors that are, are in that, that space. And there's a little um, thing I was, I was shown over there that when um, in the actual ritual of the ceremony, particularly it's not just about going into the sweat lodge, in the creation of the fire and in the, in the bringing in of the, the rocks to the fire, before the, the fire, sorry, before the rocks are brought into the fire, there is a prayer done with each rock and um, a little tobacco is put on each rock. Now, what happens with this, as soon as those rocks are officially brought into that ceremony, they're no longer just rocks. It's said that the ancestors um, come up in those rocks and help to teach the people in that Anipi ceremony to find find harmony and find balance. And this is just one example of the many uh, ceremonies that um, the native culture have that they're a part of. And uh, just in, in um, hopefully I told that story uh, well enough that you can get the understanding that um, it's not just about the physical world, it's about the spirit world and knowing that the spirit world supports us. Um, now, Adair's just uh, sent me a little message just before to, to have an ad break. <laughs> so, um, so look, what just a few things that are coming up, then I'm going to uh, go to questions. So if you've got any questions, then write them down now while I'm, I'm giving you a bit of an ad break, um, and I'll, I'll come to those questions. Um, so we've got uh, meditation in the, teep in the teepee at Gawler tomorrow night. And uh, I think there's only space for about two people left, which is great. We've got another um, uh, meditation in the teepee. And this is a, a real uh, true teepee. It's 20 foot diameter. It's about, uh, it's, well, which is about 6.4 meters wide. It's about uh, nine meters high, nine and a half meters high. And we'll have a fire going in it. And... Um, it's, it'll be decked out to look like a teepee. It's, it actually looks really good. I've just started painting it on the outside too. So it's starting to, to look really good um, after many years of being up and looking a bit dry and needing a little bit of um, dressing up. So um, then we've got... Um, uh, so that's the next two Fridays. The following Friday after that is a two-and-a-half-hour talk um at Gawler at um, um, Riverdale Spiritual Center and um, that's a talk about spirit guides so I'm going to be doing uh, talking a bit about my experiences and also uh, doing uh, some overheads or what they call overheads which is uh, just going around to everyone and, and uh, giving them a little bit of a reading from one of their guides so giving them a bit of help with some information that might be able to help with spiritual growth. So, so that's coming up then. Uh, now we've got uh, next Wednesday, um, Wednesday of next week, we've got a workshop starting online. So there's still space for more people. And this is about the chakra system and all of the auric bodies and how they intersect and uh, about other parts of the energy system. So it's, it's a, a really rewarding and... Um, informative um eight weeks so every wednesday night for eight weeks that will be and um so more than welcome to give me a ring or to ask me any questions about that one um my phone number i'm sure Adair's going to put this up in a sec is zero four one zero six five eight seven nine seven and um i'm happy to um uh tell you anything you want to know about it um what else we got? We've got uh, level two shamanism coming up uh, very soon. And we've got level three, which is uh, shamanic bodywork. And um, that's probably enough for now. So um, let's have a look at. Uh, so, those that have done level one shamanism, 
will be ready for level two if they haven't done it. And then it goes on to level three. So, um, um, the, but the information is all up on the Facebook site and there is information up on my website as well, um, which is uh, Greenwood Spiritual Journeys. All right, so where are we? Let's have a look at some questions. Um, and Clay saying a proper sweat lodge would be amazing. Well, Clay, um, funny you should say that. It looks like finally, 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 after quite a few years of not having run any sweats, I'm going to be um, setting one up very soon. So uh, I'll, when it's available, um, I'll be only, I'm not going to be doing this online, uh, sorry, on, on Facebook directly. I'll only be um, subtly inviting people along. Um, so that will be coming up hopefully before the end of the year. Uh, and I will be able to run it um, in the fire season as well because um, just because I can, I know the right people. So, um, all right, let's look for some questions. Daniel's got one. With regards to rituals and traditions, I would presume that they are sacred to each tribe. Yes, they are. How open are they with sharing their customs and traditions with us, with all of the hurt, pain and suffering they have gone through by the white people? I've Great question. Um, look, the first trip I did to Rosebud was quite a powerful time and um, I met a lot of different people and I, I certainly met three medicine men over there um, all had slight varying um, opinions on all of that um, one uh, I'm not going to mention names but one one medicine man obviously held a little bit of a and you can understand why held a little bit of a grudge a lot of white Americans it's been a very very trendy thing to have an Indian name and um a lot of white Americans have certainly tried to get that from the Native American culture. And I remember him saying to me, yeah, look, we'll give them an Indian name for a price and send them on their way. Um, but the ones, the people that really believe and really are connected and are honest and sincere and have integrity they treat a completely different way um, because every medicine man I have met, um, when you have you hold that integrity, then they work with you in a very sincere way. And uh, mostly, um, probably not everyone on a tribe is, is open to white people being a part of uh, traditions, but the majority are because they know that uh, this information needs to be shared, that uh, what the ceremonies and rituals are about needs to be shared with people that don't know. Look, one, one of the a beautiful elder that taught me quite a bit, um, um, an elder called um, uh, Albert Whitehat Sr., he said to me, and, and this was his words, he said... Uh, Look, we can't come over there to to teach our ways, but you've been here with us and you've listened and, and we know where you're coming from. So you take this back to Australia and you show them and uh, you share share what you can with with your people. And uh, so, you know, that, that kind of answers really that question. They're very open and... You know, this time that we're in now is really powerful. All of the tribes knew this time was coming where um, things were going to get rough. And uh, and this they know of as coming together of the tribes. And um, so there are elders from all tribes that meet up each year at different, different um, countries. Um, and... Uh, this is happening on a regular basis. Now, the other thing to remember, and I'm, I don't want to get in too much into galactic stuff now, but part of that um, coming together of the tribes at this time now 
Um, isn't it a coincidence or is it synchronistic that the galactic beings are getting a lot closer to us and are making themselves known more um, because they're our family too. So it's they're part of our tribe as well or we're part of their tribe. So this is a matter of everyone coming together and working together in a much more balanced way. And this is uh, what will make the people, and I'm not talking, just talking about the Native American people, this is what will make the people strong again. Um, and anyone that's of a manipulative or controlling nature is going to get pushed aside um, because uh, we know that there's a better way. It's just getting everyone to work together. Um, so I don't know who this is because I've only got Facebook user up here, but um, hi to you. Uh, are sweats safe for people with anxiety? How is it perceived if someone needs to leave the sweat before the end? There's no, anyone that says you shouldn't leave, that you have to stay in the sweat, then run a mile because they're not the right person for you to be running a sweat. Um, the whole idea of going into sweat is to see, it, it helps you to see where your blockages are. So, you know, particularly if you can, can only, can't get through, say, the first, the first level, which is the physical body, then you really need to be looking at, um, you know, how you're treating your physical. If you're having tr trouble and you want to get out at the, the second um, round, which is to do with the mental, then you know that there's something your mind needs, needs more peace. And then the third round emotions. Um, so, if you're having trouble in one of those rounds, it will always relate to whatever the energy is for each round. And um, so it's, it's on it. You're still honored as being a part of that ceremony um, if you have to leave and that's okay. Um, but generally what will happen, and this is the way I was shown is you can have people with anxiety in the sweat, but there are ways of um, dispelling that anxiety because anxiety relates to fear and ungroundedness. So all it takes is a little bit of help, a little bit of prayer and a little bit of direction. And I've helped a lot of people through the whole sweat, the whole Anipi ceremony, um, just through giving advice and uh, helping to dispel those fears that are keeping them um, in trauma and uh, wanting them to race out. But if they have to, that's okay. Um, I saw a really interesting thing. Uh, this was my introduction to a Native American running a sweat lodge. It was actually over here in the Adelaide Hills um, many, many years ago. Um, there was uh, some of the, dare I say it, older, pe older spiritual people. Might remember this name, Al Running. Um, he was a Lakota um, um, a guy and uh, he came over and he ran quite a lot of uh, um, workshops and uh, sweat lodges were a part of that and uh, he had a huge group uh, of people in his sweat lodge it was quite a big lodge and um, there were people from as young as uh, there was a 15 year old girl there who had done a lot of spiritual processes with her family there was a, a lady that was about 75 in there. There were some middle-aged people and there was a big bikey dude. And, you know, he was, I mean, he would have been at least six and a half foot tall, um, really, you know, built like the proverbial tats everywhere and um, looked very tough And because um, we all saw him roll up in his Harley. And um, But during the sweat, he was the one that had to get out. And um, you can probably guess why he hadn't dealt with his emotions. So that was the round where he got squeezed and uh, he was very embarrassed to have to leave. Um, but then when I came out of the sweat, I noticed that at the end, I noticed that um, um, Al was talking to him and uh, there were certainly some emotions being shed, some tears and... Uh, um, I believe the guy actually took off not long after that, but he, he was certainly a lot more humble and, um, and he talked to some of us too, which was nice. Uh, you know, we 
certainly didn't want him to feel like he was, you know, he wasn't strong, but that's what he felt in himself. Um, so what Patricia's asking, what is the general feeling um, around mixed sweats? Good question. Um, there, there are times when um, mixed sweats aren't appropriate. So quite often what would happen at a Sundance ceremony which is quite a big ceremony. And um, if I get the time, I'll, I'll run you through what a Sundance is about. Uh, but in that particular ceremony, um, sweats are an everyday part of that, morning and evening. And generally the women would be in one lodge and the men would be in another. It's not often that they they'd, it would be a mixed sweat. Uh, but overall, um, mixed sweats, uh, fairly common, uh, even on the reservation. Um, sometimes um, men will do sweats on their own, and um, uh, but quite often it's because there just aren't any women that wish to do it with them. So um, just like men like to do things by themselves here sometimes, um, you know, whether it be going to a garage, talking about uh, building a car or, or um, building a piece of furniture, um, the same thing can be said for sweat lodges. It's, it's sometimes it's just good for guys to get together or for women to get together and do one. But more often than not, there's a purpose behind a sweat lodge. It's not just for the hell of it. And uh, um, it could be because someone's sick, because the tribe is having trouble around something. Um, it could be because uh, some, someone is um, maybe just needs support around something that's going on for them in their life. And, uh, and what I, I noticed again, that first trip, because I spent so long over there, the first trip I, I noticed that uh, these people that are good friends with each other, they, they stick together like glue. If one person needs help, and this is... When you understand on the reservation, there can be anything up to 80% unemployment rate. And I, all of these guys I knew worked. And, um, but even with that 80% unemployment rate, if one person was needing help, then they would just take the day off or do whatever they had to do to help that person through their problems that they were going through. And um, it, was, it was just a beautiful thing to see. Um, so, um, so have we got any more questions? If we haven't, I'll, I'll talk about what a Sundance ceremony is. Um, so Sundance ceremonies are held once a year. Um, there can be several different, uh, ceremonies run by different elders, but generally speaking, um, Sundance time is in summertime. Now, what, what the Sundance is about? It's about uh, four days of uh, fasting, of dancing, um, of prayer. Um, and uh, there is um, uh, the main purpose is to give back to others. So what will happen is there will be supporters. Um, so this is all done in a round yard. That's called an arbor. And, um, and there would be a team... Uh, a, a drum, so a main powwow drum, and a team of drummers around that drum. There would be songs that are sung through the day, and the dancers, and when I say dancing, um, it's more about prayer, uh, but there are certain songs that are sung that are, about, that are all related to the Sundance ceremony. Now, these are the times, in a Sundance, this is the time where... Um, you probably may have heard of people piercing. And um, so what would happen is the, the, there's several ways the piercing is done. So part of the ceremony at the beginning is to, to plant a tree or a, a post in the ground, right in the center of the arbor. And uh, then before, before the tree actually goes up, it's, there's a hole dug um, in the center and then that, that post is, is propped up and, uh, and wedged so that post stays strong. But before it goes up, 
everyone uh, will get a strip of material and uh, either hang just a strip of material from the top or they'll uh, do prayer ties, which means they'll actually put uh, tie some tobacco into one of those strips of material. And what this is, is you, you, when you tie the tobacco into the, the strip of material, and generally they're different colours, uh, quite commonly red, black, yellow, and white for the Lakota. Um, your prayers, as you're tying that tobacco in, you're, you're putting your prayers into that tobacco, and that's there for support for everyone. So you imagine everyone that's a part of that ceremony, whether they're dancing or whether they're um, supporting, they're all putting, te- um, they're all putting uh, those prayers in, those uh, tobacco ties. So that's put in, but also there is uh, strands of leather or, or, or string that's um, left, tapped, uh, sorry, nailed to the top of that post too. So the post is put in, these uh, lengths of string are there. And what the, at some time through the four days, and generally it's around the second or the anywhere from the second to the fourth day, um, the men would generally pierce um, in the upper chest, just under the skin. So um, a, a piece of bone, just thin bone, uh, would be put in or um, a piece of, uh, I think they use cedar as well, cedar stick. Um, the medicine man would normally do that. Uh, he'd lay the person down and, and uh, put the, uh, use a, a sharp blade to do that and, um, and place the piercing in. The, sorry, the, the stick in. And then what would happen is the string would be tied to those piercings. So there may be at least six um, strings hanging down. And those strings would be tied to the piercing. Now, this sounds all gory, but the whole purpose of this is all the pain that you, you go through with this, you're giving of yourself for the people. If you can look at it like this before I finish off explaining. Um so then what would happen is that the dancer would have that, those strings tied to his chest and he would have supporters behind him as he runs backwards and the piercings would tear through the skin. And um, you can see the people on the reservation that have, peer, that have uh, done Sundance because they have those welts on their upper chest now the women when they pierce this is in most uh sundance ceremonies they pierce on the the upper um arm facing out and um, personally i haven't seen anyone tear those piercings out generally they hang a, a small eagle feather from uh those piercings and uh and so um so that goes on basically for four days and four nights. There, there are many ways that the piercings are, are done. Uh, they can also drag buffalo skulls, and I've seen a dozen buffalo skulls being dragged behind one person until the piercings break. Um, one interesting thing I might share, this was at a ceremony in Montana that I went to on a buffalo ranch. Um, this was later on, um, past 2001 it was more like about uh, 10 years ago and what happened was um there was it was a big ceremony and there were white people that were piercing and uh so this one guy um quite a tall white guy he i had seen him before at other ceremonies so he was very committed to doing this now what he did first he um he dragged buffalo skulls around the arbor and uh, so he pierced at the back and he was dragging now if you've ever seen a buffalo skull it's probably twice the size of a a normal cow's skull they're heavy and you see them 12 hooked in together bouncing around behind this guy until the piercings tear Um, now then he also went on to to tie up at the the tree in the center and when he ran backwards um, 
the skin stretched, but he didn't tear. Now, he did this twice, and he was about to do it a third time, and the, the actual leader of the Sundance ceremony stopped everything. He just completely stopped the whole ceremony. And he made a very, it was a really good uh, statement he made. He said, uh, sometimes um, we like to think that uh, we are capable of doing more than we're actually able to. He says, when the ego is, is pushing, but the heart is not willing, generally that will come out in the physical body. And that's why he didn't tear, was because uh, the ego was actually wanting to, wanting to just keep going, keep doing. Um, but his heart was saying that was enough. Um, he had done enough. So it was a great lesson for all of us um, there watching that, just how much the ego can affect how the physical body reacts to, to trauma and to, to things like that. Um, so Daniel's got another question. Is there a strong Native American community within Australia? I've certainly met Native Americans that live here. Um, I know there's at least, there's probably half a dozen that are here in South Australia. I know there's a few up in Queensland. Um, I don't know that it's unified as such, but um, I know Australia has a, that was one thing I was wanting to say before, Australia has a really good reputation over there, um, you know, because I've brought a few Aussies over to South Dakota, to the reservation, and um, um, because I was running uh, guided tours over there at one stage, just taking small groups over. And um, they loved us because we're real, number one. We don't ask stupid questions. We seem to um, um, be very heart connected as compared, not saying to all Americans, but uh, um, we, we are very interested. We, we've never experienced anything like that. So we're very eager. And, um, and they can feel that in a person. And uh, so they loved us over there. Um, and, um, and so, um, it was, it was a really great thing to experience that, uh, that bond and that connection, uh, with them. The, so there are of quite a few native Americans that have spent time out here to live. Um, and, uh, I know some have stayed. I know I met a few over in, um, Melbourne who are living up in the, now yeah, what do you, trying to remember the name of the area it's like the hinterland um, it's up in the mountains and there's some very spiritual areas in uh, um, um, there's a place called fern tree gully and uh, that's that's at the base of a lot of the hinterland over there and uh, so that that certainly goes on uh, dandenongs thank you <laughs> is that you were there um, yeah, Dandenong Rangers. So there's there's definitely some Native Americans living up that way too. So, um, um, all right. So where are we? So Clay's asking a question. This sounds so amazing, so powerful. Sundance is. It's incredibly powerful if, that, if that's what you're referring to. Um, if you ever get the opportunity... You're allowed to, there's no, no alcohol, obviously, and there's no cameras allowed, but it would be a great thing. Just work out in summertime. Generally, the, the uh, Sundance ceremonies are posted. If you go to the tribal um, um, websites, uh, the, uh, definitely they're, they're posted as to where and when they're going to be. So I'd highly suggest going to watch one. And just seeing how how the whole process goes there's a whole lot more to it than i've said um, but um, that was the main crux of it um so paul young hey paul um amazing talk very formative thank you um <laughs> hey kylie you're, it's a nice place fern tree gully um kylie used to live over there um all right, guys, look, uh, the only other thing I'd like to quickly talk about is powwows. So powwows have, um, are, are a ceremony, um, but they're, um, 
it's more instead of a, a deeply religious ceremony or deeply spiritual ceremony it it still is to a degree but this is more about uh embracing the joy of the culture and 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 it's actually quite competitive so power ceremony is done in the same uh arbor as uh sundance ceremonies are done in and uh, it's a, a round yard quite a large round yard and um so this is where um, all the people that uh, know the traditional dancers, um, what they'll do, they'll spend a lot of time through the year getting their outfits, so traditional and fancy, out, fancy outfits um, together. And they dance. There's, there's several different types of dances that are, that are there that they do. Uh, generally, the men dance separately to the women and um generally what happens is so whenever there's a particular dance on the guys that are out there dancing have a, a number uh, on their back and they're all competing for prize money and some of the dancers go all over the state and to other states to to do these um so you can imagine these guys are doing their utmost to to um to win so they're they're showing themselves off. They're showing their culture off, you know, to the people. It's it's fantastic to see, and um, particularly for me, I really like the tr traditional um, dancing and the traditional outfits, you know. And you get the guys wearing what what would have been worn two hundred years ago, um, and uh, and so um, not only do you have the dancers out there, um, but you have teams of drummers too. So, you know, a drummer, a drum that might be two to three feet diameter. Um, generally, they're about three feet diameter. Um, and uh, you might have anything up to eight to ten guys around that drum dancing and um, drumming and dancing. Sorry, drumming and singing. And so there can be anything up to ten teams of drummers um and they all get a turn so they're competing too so it's 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 a really powerful time particularly when if you stand by one of those teams of drummers it just goes right through you it's it's just incredible and that you can google on on um, um your computer just google um lakota you should get it with anything like lakota um powwows um and you'll get some some uh, imagery of that it's just it's a knockout it really is you start to see and embrace the native american culture then and look i can remember several times when i was at the powwow back in 2001 and i'd be there just just amazed by all of this and i'd look around and there were no white people anywhere and uh and i just felt so at home it felt very comfortable so um, so look i've Oh, here we go. So Paul's got a question, it looks like. Does the potential still exist to be able to learn from and participate with Native American elders? Yes, yes, very much. Are tribal people still open to such things with those who are non-Indigenous and are not their country of origin? Most definitely. Look, they, they allowed me in. Um, and it was done through appropriate ways. It was done through uh, the tribal council. Um, I ended up speaking to uh, the head um, head elder on um, on Rosebud Indian Reservation at the time, and uh, he's unfortunately passed since. But um, you can, you know, it it it's not going to be a five minute um, jump in to the reservation. You have to get a rapport going and uh, and generate communication with the guys over there and. Uh, and generally what will happen is if you offer your services to help out in some way on the reservation, you they'll actually uh, line something up for you that you can be taken into one of the families. and um, But they want to know a little bit about you. So um, th these things are possible, you know. It's just about stepping out of the norm and uh, just offering your services because one thing they need a lot of is help over there. And there's lots of ways that we can help them. Uh, I was fortunate enough to do some teaching over there and I helped out in a few other ways too. And uh, so they've got a college there and uh, 
my given trade is woodwork. And so I was teaching uh, woodwork in their college. It was, and living with a traditional family. So um, it was just a fantastic experience. Um, and one I can never possibly forget. Um, it was amazing. So look, on that note, um, thanks very much, guys. And uh, on to a new subject next week. Um, don't know what it is, but I'll surprise you a day or so before. And um, look, I wish you all the best and please Google, you know, this is the way you're going to find out about the culture, but maybe what I've done is helped to introduce you to the possibility of going over there yourself and uh, experiencing. And Lakota culture is not the only culture that uh, would allow this to happen. Um, there's tribes right throughout Canada, all over America, there are tribes and uh and reservations and all you've got to do is find the right one for you um so i don't want <laughs> hopefully the lakota tribal elders won't get this influx of a whole lot of telephone calls um they'll they'll be blaming me i'll be getting the <laughs> i'll be getting black band from going over there um no i'm sure they would so just you know do a little bit of uh, research and um, and learn, find some contacts over there. And the only way you're going to do that is to actually pick up a phone and uh, call or, um, you know, they're a bit like me. They like to do things the old-fashioned way, talk. So don't expect emails are going to get you a long way. Um, might be a good beginning, but you need to be prepared to get on the phone and actually talk to them. So... Um, uh, Paul just asking, I'll just take one more question. Um, so Paul saying, have you found similar circumstances with indigenous, indigenous Australians? Yes, very much. So what I did, um, I've got a four wheel drive. So I got up to the Flinders quite often. Now I wanted to do a trip up to, uh, Arkarula. Some, as I was getting close to Arkarula, which is probably about nine hours north of here, um, it's a typical four-wheel drive park. It's it's quite well known in the four-wheel drive circles. And um, uh, what happened was um, the closer I was getting, the less I wanted to actually go to Arkarula, and I couldn't figure out why. About 60 kilometres before you get to Arkarula, there's a camping ground, and it's actually run by the Adnamantha people. I believe that's the right way to correct way to say it. Um, now, their tribe is on the left-hand side of the road, um, just a little bit further up, but the campground is on the right-hand side, and it's a really good campground, camp kitchen. Uh, they do all kinds of uh, excursions and uh, take, there's some ochre pits there, and uh, the, there are four brothers that run the campground, and they are the best guys. And I got on, I was only there for a few nights, but... Um, I got on like a house on fire with one of the brothers in particular and uh, they're just lovely guys. So that's not far away, you know, and you can learn a lot from the Aboriginal people. Um, and look, another example is um, Major Sumner. If everyone, anyone's heard of Major Sumner or Moogie to his friends, Uncle Moogie, um, he has a website. Follow him around um, again. <laughs> Don't inundate him, but because um, I, I know him really well, he's an absolutely beautiful guy. I, I call him a good friend of mine. Haven't seen him for a little while because we've both been very busy, but uh, he's a wonderful ambassador for his people, and he'll he can help you out in uh, as well in um, maybe finding the right path for you to to connect with uh, the Naranjiri people, which uh, his people, or the Ghana people. Uh, he knows elders on both accounts, so. Um, yeah, look, I hope you um, get something out of tonight. And um, I really, you know, push you to, to make roads, step, step into um, making a stronger connection with another culture. Personally, I think that kids, when they get out of school, they should be sent off to a, a native culture somewhere in the world to learn how people really live. And um, I think that'd be a great thing for everyone. Thanks, guys, and we'll see you next week. Uh, we've got Monday night meditation coming up, and, um, and I'm moving house. Ah.
but it's all good. Um, thanks and um, enjoy safe journeys. Bye.